out here on the cylinder? There's just one way to handle the turtles in the city-states. That's with a Babylonian party sub and the smell of gunsmo- I mean, the sounds of the Civ Battle Royale X Season 3. I'm your host, Doc Ido, bringing you Cerro Sedserio's narration for Episode 10, A Thousand Galloping Hooves, in which Tamiris gets a lesson on the power of friendship, Zanana and Suharto go for a night on the town, and the North America gang finds out that Iron Jacket is haunting Pretty Nose's garden. Willkommen, bienvenue, and welcome to the 10th episode of the CBRX3. My name's Sero Said Serio, lost and found mod of Civ AI games, small-time Civ designer come wannabe modder, evening botanist, Australian history nerd, etc., etc. I'm here to bring you some swinging AI shenanigans in what shall be my first proper narration of an AI game. Why am I a CAG mod again? So be gentle. I'm new to this. The OC Spotlight this week includes the weekly comic by Orange, illustrating perfectly the sheer Shakespearean tragedy of the Comanche, and how nothing, NOTHING, could have prevented it. Another Poland Ball comic, Care of Explosive Watermelon, and one I can't fully understand, but enjoy anyway. This damn generation with the tiki takis and the vines! Is this what's called a meme? A shitpost? What is it? And here's a message from our sponsors, you. The message is one of gratitude. Thank you for all your continued support, and as always, more contributions are appreciated. Tuva is holding steadfast in first place, beating out their Siberian rivals, the Permians, who themselves have regained some ground and made it to the number two spot. Will Azike regain his top spot this episode? Or will he continue to squander his opportunities and not do anything? Let us see, shall we? Onwards! As a nice, soft introduction, we get a shot of Central America, or, well, South Mojave, really. Francisco Morazon has really fluffed it in the settling department, and I doubt they'll be able to navigate an army through the Mexican jungles to conquer anything. But feel free to prove me wrong. Cambodia seems content to stay as a city-state and just vibe with some cool tunes from the chief. They've made peace with the Philippines, really the only possible sieve they could get a city off of, so, unless something drastic happens, I dare say this is as big as they'll get. Casting back to the last slide, Central America has also made peace with the Seminole. I could say it's a lost opportunity to gain Cuscawilla, but they didn't have the Navy for it regardless. Dateline, Chongjin, AD 200. The Mori Navy's surprise attack on Chongjin has wrought much destruction, but is faltering fast. While the general public would have thought the much more smart and rational target was the puppet city of Tajihi Sarugake, what with its difficulty to be taken by land, the Mori Navy disagrees. For is it not the perfect subversion of expectations? Admiral Peter Easton, for his part, has been lost at sea. He doesn't know where he is, what he's doing, or why his navy has left him behind to get peppered with arrows from Jeju Island. When asked about the situation, Chieftain Kim Il-sung said to our reporters that he feels stable and happy. When pressed on why North Korea has been the target of so much foreign aggression, the glorious leader gave out a stern look, cancelled the press conference, and ushered our journalists out of the country. Last I've heard, Yemen is currently only at war with Egypt, but if Al-Sulehi is setting her sights on Pandya, she seems to have misread some maps, and what she took for a bustling harbor city was, in fact, a small elephant shipping yard servicing the very landlocked Korkai. 
continued from page three. Let's see here. After an ordeal involving being black bagged into a cart by a Korean general confidently professing he was a god of wealth and luck, and trying to get back to whatever a Tang dynasty was, our journalists reached Korea's north border. There they observed that the situation was much worse than what they let on in the capital. The Gok Turks had amassed more reinforcements to siege Ham Hung, and just off the coast, the Ainu fleet had descended from the north, setting course for Tajihi Sarugake. Our writers reported the Gok Turks as very amicable, readily sharing the meals they had made especially for the siege. Steamed hams, they called them, a regional delicacy at that time of the year in that part of the countryside located entirely on the battlefield. Not sure how long this war's been on for, but Tamiris has managed to get the Yemeni exclave and holiday home of Asir down to half health. Asir's chances of not being annexed, or worse, are, let's say, slim, what with quite literally no reinforcements to be seen. It looks like Al-Sulehi has gotten tired of the Caspian's beaches and is now looking elsewhere for her holidays. Maybe southern India. Try as they might to expand by settling, the Kievan Rus is running out of space to do so. A city on the Bosporus would be excellent for them, and they do have a settler near enough to make us all mad when they don't end up settling there. Foreseeing that they may have to expand by other means, Olga has recruited Scotsman, or I suppose Irishman in this universe, Adam Smith, to both invent economic theory and use it to buy some cities off of Vladimir. Bold strategy. Only time will tell if it works. The mysterious and lonely Himalayas are now ripe for some new settlements. Afghanistan claims Mount Kailash with its new city of Khost, and Kokang is looking to expand the local flower market with Hitin Parkeng. The mountains are also doing wonders for Kokang's defense against Bengal. My shipments have barely been affected. The Rio has found its La Plata, and it has found it on Isla de los Estados. Bless their hearts, they are trying to make up lost settling spots, but they're going to have a hell of a time defending them against Chile. The Falklands, though, still lay there, unsettled, ready to make a meme out of whatever civilization does so. Dreams of Arapaqua succession are quashed, as Pretty Nose sends out missionaries to foster social cohesion amongst its fairly recent settlements. Rumors are that the locals there are practicing some strange beliefs from a long-dead god, hence quite the wave of missionaries. Ohio is, of course, still unsettleable. Umbarara is in the red, but will Kilwa manage... Yes, the answer is, of course, they'll flip it, and it'll most likely flip back. Down the coast, Uganda is not focusing on the heavily muscular threat to their north, but is pillaging some Swahili farms outside Zanzibar instead, perhaps to feel better about Masaka. Down in the capital, Kilwa has recruited Stonewall Jackson, which, much to my dismay, is not a nickname for Marsha P. Johnson or anyone else involved in the Stonewall riots, but is in fact a U.S. Confederate general. I'm just going to head candidate as the former, though, and picture them bricking some Ugandan police chariots. Dateline, Karakoja, AD 225. There's dancing in the streets of the Kocho capital as master diplomat John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, has skillfully organized a peace with Tuva. When pressed for comment, Churchill simply replied, Please, please, just leave me be. I need rest. Such wise words from a wise man. As per the treaty, the Tuvan troops, previously besieging the city, 
have been jettisoned into the surrounding sand dunes of the Gobi. Let me tell you, there is many a look of bewilderment on the soldiers' faces, as most of them, and us in fact, thought they had this in the bag. Mojave is feeling ballsy. There's only one spearman at Avimota, and yet Irataba has declared war anyway. However, Tamiris will have to lead her troops quite a way through rugged terrain to attack, so I think their city to the west is safe for the time being. Dateline, Dili, 225 AD. Thousands flock to the streets outside Madame Louise Chouy's new fashion store, Chouy's Boutique Royale. Its grand opening will surely herald Timor-Leste's rise to be the fashion capital of the world, as even now, Madame Chouy counts many world leaders amongst her patrons. Dili's own Zanana Guzmao exits dressed in a chic new navy blue dinner jacket with matching cummerbund and cravat. Yonggu elder Wonggu shows off a stylish golden skirt embroidered with various animal totems and color matched exquisitely to his ceremonial ochre. And Indonesia's Suharto is sporting a lovely white silk robe with floral ruby accents, complete with a wide brim sun hat, the newly built Borneo settlement of Medan, and a stylish autumnal tote. Couture Boutique Royale is located in Central Dili, 41 Rua de Formosa. Stop by or stay out of fashion. War breaks out in Southern Europe. Tito could have a chance to take some Dutch cities. After all, William III can never seem to catch a break, if not for the presence of the no man's land between Amsterdam and Skopje. That's certainly some rough terrain, buddy, and it will take a while for that army to move, too. Kokang and Bengal have made a formal peace, not that you'd have known they were at war for lack of bloodshed, Olive Yang making very good use of those mountains. I feel Shuja ud Din would be best served shoring up central India, but it seems he has his eyes elsewhere with a settler heading off south to Indonesia. Oh, and there's a Wirajuri Barawidiani. Say hi! There's a lot of them throughout the world, for some reason. See if you can spot them all. Bolstered by the successful capture of Rotterdam, Ireland is gunning for more Dutch holdings. Collins has his sights set on The Hague, you know, for the war crimes, and has called on his navy to deploy and take the city. For their sake, hopefully they won't make an Irish landing of it like they did with Frankfurt. Oh, wow, what a shocker. Kilwa has flipped Mbarara. Anyways, After solidly fluffing the attack on Capua by focusing on one too many targets, Mali and the Normans have declared peace. To celebrate, and to take the pressure off of the attack on Fez, Sundiata has settled the city of Jene, fated to one day contain a great mosque. With any luck, it might actually happen. They'd just have to speck into piety. The front gets ever closer to the Ham Hung, with the Ainu joining in as well. The Mori navy has completely disappeared, save for Easton, still lost. But no matter, for the Ainu are having a go now. Off to the west, the Han continue to claim more and more of China, with two settlers roaming the Shangdong region. The Gokturks settle Wrangel Island, connecting with the Kwakwakwaku borders and bringing the old and new worlds together with the wonders of border tension. Dateline Ka'akim, 250 AD. The Tuvan cavalry has gathered on their western border.
The troops wait in silent anticipation as Donduk Kular crests the hill in front of them. He gives off a confident air that dampens the tension built around him. A short, impassioned speech about loyalty, strength, and country follows, and at the end, a declaration of war. The troops march off towards the town of Izur. News out of eastern Permian lands tells of a military absent from the front, with Azuke's focus lying elsewhere. The defenses of the frontier towns look woefully unprepared for a fight. A war between what many esteemed international organizations consider to be the first and second place nations in the world has shocked many to the core. I feel I can speak for all of us when I say we'll all watch on with bated breath. Oh, and Setshwayo of the Zulu was there as well, providing Kular with moral support. Not too much to see here, another Barawidiani, though of particular interest is a Timorese settler just north of Ainaro. Could they settle Mindanao before the Philippines get to? Ming is really feeling the pressure here, being boxed out by both Kokang and the Han, and only managing to get three cities on the mainland so far. With such a situation as this in their homeland, building some more cities in Hawaii doesn't seem like a bad idea. They do seem to have some settlers heading there, after all. Robert recruits his younger brother William of the Principate to lead someone. I can't really guess at where he's sending him off to, maybe Cyprus, so maybe they don't get along. For reference, the Conqueror buffs nearby disembarking units and can construct a citadel and courthouse in a conquered city, which Memphis is, this, in turn, makes the city count for a part of the UA. The first city on each landmass provides the capital with horses and gold and faith if it was conquered. Reminder, though, that Europe and Africa are considered one landmass, so no horses from Benevento. Tomyris sees her chance at a distracted target, and declares war on the Permians in hope of taking Oxus back. She'll have to wrap up in Asir soon to not get distracted, and it's worth noting the Masagete unique unit you see here, the Battle Axeman, is a swordsman replacement and should be able to take the city. So it shouldn't take too long, but you know the AI. For this transgression of hospitality, after all, are the Permians not guests in Oxus? Tamiris has three exciting new war declarations on her desk, adding to the pile of ones she's already received throughout the episode that I just haven't seen fit to mention. Ireland, mate. It shouldn't be this hard. I'm rooting for you. I really am. But... Your navy is right there, and Frankfurt is undamaged. I only hope so much. At least that poorly timed Frankfurt settler should prove to be a win for Ireland. Should. And now for a bit of a gander at the religion map. Arapaho Nestorianism, Anglo-Dutch Lutheranism, and Turkish Sunni are all doing very well for themselves currently. On the flip side, Theravada is doing about as well as their founders, the Kocho, are. That is to say, it isn't. While Irish Oriental, surely Occidental, Orthodoxy, and Kayapo Catharism haven't traveled terribly far yet. And is Zanuo Tengri, or how did that happen? We might need a closer look at those Arapaqua cities at some point. 
The newest island getaway spot has been settled in the Caribbean. Vilcabamba, they call it. After La Serena, now referred to as the City of Serene, was taken over by the fun police, the hip youths had no place to get away from the man and the capitalist machine and the bloodthirsty simulation of alternative history that they can't escape from. But now they do. A couple, in fact. Olinda is also advertising itself as the perfect holiday spot, and so too will a new Muisca city, if they ever settle down. It's not moved since last episode, so no. Given how crowded Kuromoro is getting, it's no surprise that they'd want to think of a better afterlife. The Temple of Heaven apparently provides 15% food and faith during Golden Ages, and 20% of faith contributes directly to Golden Age progress when piety is devout. Just what they need. More food and more faith. In other news, from the top left, drugs don't make you happy. Well, illicit ones, anyway. Tamiris is getting a bit distracted and has still not taken a seer, despite all its defenses being gone. Her focus is instead on Ishkar, which, to her credit, is probably a better play than focusing on Oxus. On the plus side, all this focus east means Avimota is safe from Masagete aggression. So that's nice. Wendy, come on, man. This is disappointing. And you're making me look bad. Look, get it? I've got attention issues too. That's why you didn't get a new design for this season. But either focus on conquering or on settling. You're simply running out of time. Also, side note to you Yanks and Brits, because it bugs me to no end. And I've got a soapbox to stand on now. Uluru's pronounced Uluru, not Uluru. Get a load of this guy over here. Yeah, Mr. Fancy Pants thinks he could tell us how to pronounce his own country's words. Heh. <laughs> Dateline, Ryazan, AD 300. The biting cold air of the far north chills the settlers to the bones. One finds in the ranks of the Vladimir Arctic Expedition only those who truly have no other options back home. Food is scarce, the winter is long and heavy, and the promised city coliseum will likely not be built here for centuries to come. Life in Ryazan is miserable, and yet others still come. Word says that Norse settlers seek to find their home in the icy wastes, and the Lithuanian colonies grow ever forward as well. One must think, is this drive for expansion really worth this? And now, a message from our sponsors. Seeking new horizons? Want some adventure in your life? Then come to the pristine Arctic, where life can be a winter holiday all year round. Horsemen land on the shores of Andalusia, ready to fight some Castilians, only to find that Robert Giscard has already gone and signed a treaty to end the war. Maybe next time, guys. The Yugo-Anglo-Dutch War is really heating up, though. Standing either side of the Rhone River, two riders are locked in a fierce staring contest, neither daring to move a muscle. The war with Masagete is severely hampering the Permians' ability to reinforce their east. Tuva is already on the doorstep of Izur, and the only defenses nearby are scattered horsemen and catapults, though this is the AI, so they can easily screw it up. 
It's all well and good to expand your borders, but you need to keep on top of a standing army and not waste too much manpower on, say, what should have been an easy war with Khazaria. Hamhung has beefed up a bit with its defense. I mean, this is the glorious best Korea, of course. Why wouldn't it be? Those Gok Turks would never be able to take it now. What? Tajihi Saragake? Uh, you, you can't see that. It's behind mountains. Pay no attention to the Ainu Navy. Jeez, finally. That took forever. The Masagete take a seer after lounging about on the sunbeds for a few years. Bulan, meanwhile, looks on longingly. He liked going to Asir. It was a nice distraction from, you know, the rest of Khazaria. He'll miss it. Dare I get my hopes up, Ireland? No. Frankfurt's still undamaged, a Brandenburg fleet has arrived, and the only ones doing anything to The Hague are Freddy's generals citadeling it. The U.S. and the Cree were at war? Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained, I suppose. More interestingly, in my opinion at least, Zonowo has somehow adopted Peotism, the old Comanche, F, religion. If I were to guess, this is probably something to do with leftover pressure and the fact that the city only has a low population, but this does make it Peotism's only city currently, Quahadi having been converted. And for those wondering about the new gameplay mod in CBR this season, uh, Religion Founder Replacement, where you can capture a holy city and get founder beliefs, it shouldn't trigger here since the Arapaho already have a religion. So we'll have to keep watching for that. Memphis is on the verge of toppling. Turkey has set up a nice firing line in the Levant, and I'm not sure what that Turkish unit next to the city is. I think it might be a horseman, but they have plenty of melee units around they just have to get past the Norman ships first. The Chad-Uganda War has ended pretty conclusively in Idris Debi's favor, having solidly locked down Masaka after taking it. It looks like Debi now plans to add insult to injury with that settler near Kampala, perhaps to make future wars that much easier. Off screen, the best boys, they're still my child after all, have started warring with best, well, only, Korea. Angola, not just content with Central Africa, has branched out into the Sahara, who knows why, with their new city of Luena. I guess there is quite a lot of salt around. But if Savimbi is trying to go for some yield porn, I'm sorry to say, Jonas, but Petra has already been taken by the best boys. Oh, and Mbarara's back to Uganda, etc., etc. Mali's officially given up and made peace with Tetuan. Pirate Queen Alhura has come out on top in this war, sorta. She recaptured her city that she initially gave away. That's a win, right? And now she can focus on reigniting her war with the Dutch. Shame their closest coastal city is The Hague, though. Tamiris takes Ishkar. Could this be a comeback? Next stop, Oxus, perhaps? Don't get your hopes up, but do remain cautiously optimistic. Ishkar might well become a meat grinder soon, 
but at least that will keep Permian troops distracted around Uros. Across the mountains, in an effort to escape their problems, the Permians have sent a settler into the Moha... I mean, the Gobi Desert. All these settlers have got me thinking, what a chad move it would be to settle the Red Sea right next to Egypt's capital. What a Norman move it would be to settle the Suez right next to Egypt's capital. What an Egyptian move it would be to settle anything, even right next to your capital. You're so small, Akhenaten. Please. Masagete can take Ishkar all they want. No worries. Azike's got Ishma now. And it's got Blackjack and Hookers. What is it with all these Is city names anyhow? With even more sieves like Afghanistan slowly inching their way into the Gobi, the desert's looking nice and colorful right about now. Enjoy the border war while it lasts, because soon this will all belong to its rightful owners, the Mojave. Dateline Memphis, AD 425. Every house has a picture of him on the mantelpiece. Every man and their dog stops to swoon in the street when he walks by. Everything he touches turns to gold in the eyes of his admirers. The nation's darling, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, has won over his people's hearts well and truly, and the recent conquest of the Norman city of Memphis has only further cemented that fact. For just last Friday, the Turkish government passed a motion into law to make it official that Ataturk was just the cutest. So beloved, so sweet and kind, perhaps a little bloodthirsty, but all the best leaders are. When asked if all the praise had gone to his head, Ataturk simply responded with a series of stylish poses, culminating in blowing a kiss to a member of the press gallery who subsequently fainted. Nobody thought it likely but the Mori have done what was once thought impossible. Take Tajihi Sarugake back? No. What? No. Settling a third city on Japan, of course. Oh, what a novel idea. Settling your home region? What will they think of next? Back east, the Ainu Navy has been beaten by glorious Korea. It seems not even a navy can crack this veritable citadel of a city. The Kayapo have recruited Gottlieb Daimler, inventor of the high-speed liquid petroleum-fueled engine, and they must keep this invention a closely guarded secret, though. Imagine what havoc could be wrought on the environment if this got into the wrong hands. Regardless, they've used their newfound combustion engines to build Borobudur. It's supposed to give three free missionaries. But I guess they got lost in the jungles or the crowds of people. Pretty Nose is gradually filling up Arapaho territory after the Comanche War, both with new cities like Nuo Iteng and a larger army carpet, though the latter could still be much larger. Also, geez, apparently Gediminas is a dictator now, and the madman's declared war on Vermont. The Philippines have never had the best of times in the CBR, even in the very first mark. They were out very early, and it looks like they might not be in for the long haul here either. Though, I get ahead of myself. Yang needs to move her armies around jungles and mountains to get to Cavite El Viejo and make sure her navies don't get distracted and split up. This won't be an easy war, but it does highlight how precarious a position the Philippines find themselves in.
Ali Rani also joins in on the war with the Philippines, though with all the distance between her and Aguinaldo, I don't see much happening, maybe a snipe, if that. Otherwise, Pandya should really snatch up Sri Lanka. You've got a settler there. There's a Sri Pada, some crabs, everything you need for a good city. Come on, Rani. You know you want it. Castile was running out of room on Iberia. I mean, there's still some spots, I guess. But you know what? The Anglo-Dutch had a peninsula they weren't using, so problem solved. Thus, a brand spanking new Oviedo. The Dutch and the Irish will need to quickly settle some land, else they might get boxed out of their own home regions. Tuva recruits Khaled ibn al-Walid to bolster their Permian offensive. In a previous life, he was a commander against and then for the Prophet Muhammad, and then a commander in the Rashidun Caliphate shortly after. The Tuvan army is starting to scatter, which doesn't bode well for any cohesive attacks on the cities. To add to that, they haven't yet managed to damage any cities either. Seems like golden boy Ataturk couldn't hold on to Memphis for very long. Between Turkey's ranged troops on the coast and the Normans, albeit dwindling, navy, this back and forth might go on for some time yet. Incidentally, that Norman settler near the Suez has since been killed. We'll just have to wait a bit longer for a Suez settled. Fingers crossed. The Zulu just be vibin' currently. Sent off a DOW to the Philippines, but that won't go anywhere, really. Things are just quite peaceful here on the Cape currently. So peaceful, in fact, that that Botswanan settler has not moved since last episode. Dateline, New York, AD 450. Depressing sights out of the U.S. as the nation is plunged into uncertain times. With less appetite for war of late, barracks buildings have had to lay off workers in droves. Funding into civil service technologies has been slashed, and even some families have been forced to disband. In the bustling town of New York, for example, Citizens line up for hours just to get their meager rations of luxury copper, where once a single working woman could buy an entire coil of the stuff for only an hour's pay. The country has been unhappy for a while now, but recently the office of FDR has announced what it calls a new New Deal, different from the older New Deal that underpins the very country itself, Certain great people points whenever they adopt a new policy, culture from customs houses and manufactories. This new New Deal is described by Roosevelt as, How about I settle another city and you all pull yourself up from the bootstraps and stop your damn complaining? The jury is still out on whether this bold economic strategy will work. An interesting war erupts up north as Greenland attacks Vermont. This is going to be hard for Hans, though, what with all the terrain in the way. I don't see it going very far. Zonouo is also, now, sadly, Nestorian. It was fun while it lasted. On second thought, maybe Hans is going for Iceland. They certainly have a navy ready. It will be tough, though. Vermont's recruited Taizong, second emperor of the Tang dynasty, who is a bit butthurt he didn't get in this season, and is looking to take out some aggression on some enemies. Not content with having lost the settling contest for Patagonia, Rio de la Plata aims to become a nuisance for Chile, 
having settled Jujuy, an island town that now blocks any Chilean naval access for Maipo. Also the other way around, but I don't think RDLP cares at this point, to be honest. Big plays from Debbie here as he settles Kelo right outside Kampala. Very defensible, to be sure, but that same rough terrain keeping it safe takes away a bit from its use as a staging point for future wars. Good settle regardless. Kilwa settlers long for some banging tunes to listen to as they sail out east. And so in comes Don Arden, manager of various rock acts such as Jerry Lee Lewis, Black Sabbath, and Electric Light Orchestra. They may or may not come up later as great musicians. I'm sure Lax will show them off. Here's the Amazon for this episode. Not much going on, but it's always good to see that nobody's clear-felled the rainforest yet. Golden Boy status reaffirmed. Ataturk has taken back Memphis, though really it could fall back to the Normans. They do have some ships on the way. Up north, though, he's made peace with Vesevalod. Unable to retake Adana after the initial pushes of the war, Ataturk seems content with citadeling Samandar instead. Way to kick Bulan when he's down. Meanwhile, on the Permian Masagete front, the new conquest of Ishkar is under threat. Oxus is still undamaged despite its location. And, surprisingly, Azike is attacking Jaxartes. Go big or go home, I suppose. The Ming city of Guangzhou will soon be more cut off from the main territory. The Han and Kokang are sending more settlers to fill out the region, and I doubt Ming has any open border policies. The city will fall very easily whenever Han makes a go for it. To distract from their failings, Yongle has DOW'd Kocho, who has just been vibin', not hurting no one. Way to beat on the little guy. Yeah, Ronnie, good on ya. Pandya finally gets Sripada by settling Manar. At the very least, this will stop someone else from potentially forward settling her capital. Isur is now at half health, as the Tuvans have now started to besiege the city. Permian reinforcements have made it to the front, but they are still outnumbered currently. Donduk Kular, for his part, is so confident right now that he has settled the new city of Sug Aksi, absolutely positive that it won't come under fire. We'll see if that hubris stands or not. To help with their naval warfare, Guiscard has hired John Hawkins. And sure, that could be John Hawkins, the English naval commander, privateer, and slaver. Or it could be John Hawkins, the champion Australian rower, winner of third and first place for a lightweight four in two Penrith Cups, and bronze, bronze, medalist for a lightweight eight in the 1977 World Rowing Championships. And, like, really, who's more likely? Dateline, Kandahar, AD 500. Ahmad Shah Durrani himself, dressed as he often is in his military attire, climbs the many steps of the soon-to-be-opened Chichen Itza. Flanked by right-hand men and women, sword in hand, Durrani slashes the ceremonial red ribbon to the cheer of the gathered masses watching on below, officially opening the temple for all. Although the Afghan belief system is a closely guarded secret from foreigners such as myself, from what I could gather, the temple 
is dedicated to some form of local war god, possibly one that was incarnated into Durrani himself. But I have also heard mutterings of the temple being a monument dedicated to some form of poultry flatbread dish eaten in secret. Regardless of its official purposes, the monument will be a great boon for the country, increasing national happiness by four, and making certain that Afghan golden ages last longer. Oh, yay, a great artist. I, I also love those. Uh, now let's see who Karl Bruyulov is. Ah, famous for painting the last day of Pompeii. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, that's a bad omen if I ever saw one. Please, Collins, please. I really want you to do well, but it's just been disappointing. And now those Brandenburg and Greenlandish settlers look menacing. Schwedegon Paya has been built in Potsdam. The real-life Burmese stupa is a true monument to Brandenburg's splendor. It gives 20% science, plus 3 science, and plus 2 science on religious buildings. Lutheranism does have basilicas, but they might not count for this. A land war will be very drawn out due to the rugged terrain, and whilst Chile does have the upper hand in naval capacity, Quito isn't coastal, so the only real target for them would be the Inca's island colonies in the Pacific, a number of which might be freshly founded as the Inca continue to send settlers east. To be quite honest, at first I thought the U.S. declaration was just pissing in the wind, but yeah, I had forgotten about the basically unguarded Caribbean party islands. If FDR were to properly mount an attack here, he could easily expand his Antillean holdings and shut down all the happening parties being held there. Typical bloody fun police. Chongjin has proven time and time again to be a tough nut to crack, so the Ming have come up with a novel strat of trying to aggressively, like, very aggressively, settle Chongjin. The Hermit Kingdom looks to live up to its name, as they are very effectively defensively turtling, but also not really expanding outside of the peninsula. In fact, the Ming may soon end up colonizing right on their southern doorstep. Greenland's offensive against Vermont has backfired slightly, with Holstein's Borg coming under fire from Allen's archers. They're a long way from taking the city, but it would be quite the show to see Vermont expand north, having already fluffed it well and truly by ceding Montpellier. Down the coast, FDR completes his new New Deal by settling a new city, New Angeles, I mean Los Angeles. Wow, the sheer audacity of that settle by Savimbi. If that doesn't provoke Mali to attack him, precious little would. And looking around the Sahara, Mali really needs to do something quickly, since not only are Angola and, of all civs, Yugoslavia gradually encroaching, Chadian settlers have been spotted traveling the sand dunes looking for a place to make home. Oof. Cavite El Viejo doesn't look like it will stay in Philippine hands for very long now, as Olive Yang sends an impressive force to bear down on the city. Aguinaldo doesn't have any other cities he can flee to, only the two in this shot so he'd need some master diplomacy to get out of this one, I feel. 
and First Blood has been drawn in the Battle of the Giants. Tuva captures Izur. Azike may well take back the city, and could conceivably end the war with all his territory back, but this sure does take the shine off the Permians, previously first ranked for quite a while. Well, at least they got back Ishkar, for now, at least. And that's all there is, folks. Thus ends Episode 10 of the Civ Battle Royale X3. Thank you all for having me. I've been Sero Said Serio. This has been a lovely, if slightly daunting, endeavor. Hopefully I didn't ramble on too long. I tend not to know what I'm doing most of the time. Any and all feedback is always welcome. So until next time, au revoir. And I'll wish you a fond farewell for myself as well. Until next week, this is Doc Ido, Seabrick's audio narrator. The first man they listen for, the last man they want to hear. It's a chancy job. It makes a man watchful and a little lonely. What? No, I don't listen to the radio classic station too much. That's nonsense. <laughs>